Thank you for joining us. My name is Charlie Joyce, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Providence College podcast. As always, we are joined by producer Chris Judge of the class of 2005. Today's guest is Mike Rodak, graduate of the class of 2013. Mike is entering his sixth season as a sports reporter and analyst with ESPN, covering the Buffalo Bills of the National Football League year-round. He also contributes to ESPN.com as a writer and to SportsCenter and NFL Live as a television reporter. His job has allowed him to travel across the country to 25 NFL stadiums as well as to Toronto and London to cover games. Mike joined ESPN full-time in 2013 after assisting what was then known as ESPNBoston.com for three seasons with their coverage of the New England Patriots while he was a student at Providence College. And I might add, he covered the 2012 Super Bowl when the Patriots squared off against the, uh, the New York Giants. Mike, welcome to the Providence College podcast. Thanks for having me on. As you know, we're taping the podcast a couple of days, or taping it by phone, I should say, a couple of days uh, before the opening of the Bills training camp. And you obviously are, are a veteran of several of these training camps, Mike, but uh, still, it must be kind of an exciting time for you. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I enjoy watching football. I enjoy being out there and, and watching practice and going through all these press conferences and interviews. So it doesn't usually seem like work, you know, standing out there to watch football all day. Um, so I guess I'm blessed in that aspect. I have a job where, uh, again, it's just not, not a ton of stress, to be honest, even though there are some busier moments, especially during camp, you might have to do TV and, uh, you know, write a story within a, a pretty small window, but, at the end of the day, you know, I wake up every morning and, and feel like I have a pretty fun job to go to and a job that um, there's never really a dull moment either in terms of some of the, the drama out here as well. So, uh, yeah, it's enjoyable. Um, have, have camp roll around now where it's the sixth year of me doing it. It's almost crazy to, to think that, but, um, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same schedule every year to get back into the same routine of covering practice and then covering games and, Maybe there'll be another playoff berth for the Bills. We'll see. Sure. Um, but it's been fun here for six years. Great, great. Can you kind of visually set the camp scene for us, Mike? Uh, what's, what's the attendance like? And uh, it seems to me teams are making uh, the, the training camps more and more of a, of, of a fan experience. Is, is that the case up in Buffalo? Definitely is, yeah. So they have camp out at St. John Fisher College, which is in Pittsford, New York. It's about... I'd say a five or 10 minute drive outside of downtown Rochester, uh, probably about six hours, six and a half hours from Providence, I'd say about an hour and a half from Buffalo. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty decent hike for anybody who's coming from Buffalo just for the day to watch practice. It's not exactly an easy, quick drive, but one of the reasons why they wanted to have it in Rochester was because, you know, the Buffalo market is pretty small by NFL standards and they wanted to expand and become more of a regional brand. So part of that was having training camp in Rochester. And then for a while, they were playing a game in Toronto as well because there's a lot of fans of the Bills in southern Ontario. So the Toronto game didn't really work out. They ended that, I think, after the 2013 season. But they are going, I believe this is their 18th year now at St. John Fisher College. And it's it's a very nice suburb. It's, it's kind of a, you know, tree line streets and sleepy little town. Um you know, some better hotels and better restaurants there. It's a nice little spot, I think, for fans to stop by. Um, but it is a college, so the players are in dorms. Uh, even us as media, we stay in dorms if we're staying overnight. You know, the team offers us a, a, a room to stay in, um, which is not bad. Um, and, you know, it's it's definitely a smaller atmosphere, I'd say, than what I remember from Patriots camp. Or Patriots camp, there might be 10, 12,000 people there per day. I'd say it's closer to the three, 4,000 uh, person range. There's a couple of night practices where I think it, it gets a little higher than that. And there's a couple of early week practices where maybe there's only a thousand fans there, but it is a nice little atmosphere. Um, now the question is for the bills, are they going to keep it there? You know, we'll see. It's a lot of NFL teams are going more towards the model of having training camp at their home facility, because that's where all their meeting rooms are and their, their top notch cafeteria and training rooms, et cetera. The Bills actually upgraded a lot of their facilities back home in Orchard Park, New York, outside of Buffalo within the last four or five years. And there's been a lot of talk that 
they're eventually going to move back there. So, you know, we'll see how things go the next couple of years. But for right now, it's been fun to enjoy training camp out there. Sure, sure. I would think it would be more conducive from the team and, and coaching standpoint to, um, you know, to, 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 to have a smaller venue where there's less distraction. Exactly. And a lot of coaches do say that, that they want to get their team away from really, honestly, their families for a couple of weeks and get into that almost that summer camp vibe where you're bonding with your teammates, you're, you know, you're sleeping in a dorm with the teammate, you're getting up and eating a meal with them. You know, you're, you're after practice, after everything's done, you're hanging out with them in the, in the dorms and then going to bed as opposed to, you know, getting up at home and maybe there's distractions at home and then going to practice and coming back home where there may not be as much bonding uh, between teammates. So there's definitely an aspect of that where coaches, I think want to keep that that camaraderie and again, you know, going away to camp and sort of the team building aspect. But there, you know, there are other coaches I think want to be back in their in the comforts of their meeting rooms with the, you know, the Bills right now at, at this college are going to be using you know classroom uh, technology at, at St. John Fisher, whereas you know they spent millions on the technology back in their meeting rooms and again you know their cafeteria is top notch now. Right. back at their practice facilities. So it's different, um, but it's a trade-off either way. Sure, sure. And from the player's standpoint in terms of, of training camp, Mike, it's got to be very, very different uh, from the regular season in, in terms of competitiveness. Uh, do, you, do you find that as a member of the media that, that uh, training camp is, is, I don't know, is it maybe tense at times? What is the atmosphere from from their standpoint? It definitely can be. I'd say you get about a week or a week and a half in the training camp, and I think total the Bills are going to be out in Pittsburgh for about three weeks. So once you get towards the end, players sort of get tired of hitting each other is always what you hear. So, you know, that second week of training camp, there's usually a week, at least one scuffle or one big fight among players just because, you know, tensions is kind of, brew over the course of eight or nine, ten different practices, and they're they're in pads, which they haven't been since um, last season. So they're hitting each other. There's a lot of contact. It's 80, 90 degrees outside. Um, and, you know, that's just how things go. Uh, it's competitive business. There's 90 players on the roster right now, and by the end of August, they'll have to whittle that down to 53 players. So you have guys who are you know, competing against one another for a roster spot, for a job, for a livelihood and uh, there's definitely a, a tension that can result out of that. Shifting gears to the regular season now, Mike, I, I would imagine you have very few days off. What, uh, what is, uh, I'll, I'll say, a typical work week, and uh, when you travel, does that kind of factor into that typical work week notion? Definitely does, yeah. There is really no typical work week, I guess, in the NFL in terms of what we know, you know, is 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. That's just doesn't really exist either for us or for the teams themselves. Once you get into training camp, it's in a lot of cases you lose track of the days. This, you know, is it Monday? Is it Friday? Sometimes I don't even know. Um, but you know, training camp it's it's not as bad as it used to be. Like when I first started in 2010, the NFL is still doing two a days. So there's two different practices each day that we'd have to watch. They got rid of that in their collective bargaining agreement in 2011. So it's only one padded practice per day that we watch. It's a little bit of a lighter schedule. Once you do get into the season, we don't actually don't we're not allowed to watch practice other than the first ten or fifteen minutes, which is just stretching and players kind of warming up and really the purpose for us out there is just to take attendance, see who's out there, see who's injured, see who's not gonna practice. Otherwise during the week it's a lot of um, interviews with there's usually a daily press conference with the head coach. Uh, usually a once a week press conference with some of the assistant coaches. And then we also get 45 minutes inside the locker room every single day to uh, talk to players, interview players the way we want to, whatever we want to do there. So usually if let's say it's a Sunday game, we're going to be at the facility Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Tuesday is the players off day. So we're not there. And then Saturday is either if it's a home game, will be our off day. Um, but if we're traveling, like you said, it's, you know, you could be up at nine or 10 getting on a plane on Saturday morning and then flying to, you know, wherever Houston, you know, Cincinnati or wherever, and you're spending most of your Saturday on the road. 
and then covering the game Sunday, getting up Monday morning, and doing it all over again for, for 17 weeks. So uh, that becomes a grind. Um, and who knows? Like, if even it could be, you know, 7 o'clock on a, on a Wednesday night and you just got home, and let's say the team just made a roster move or some sort of transaction, well, you know, you're writing a story about that. So there's that 24-7 aspect where you're very much on call for whatever breaking news might happen. And that's true really throughout the year, the entire offseason. The difference with the offseason, offseason is that you're not really there at the facility too much. So there's a little bit less stress this time of the year where you're not having to get up and, and drive there and have to do interviews every single day. And now when you travel with the team, Mike, or should I, I should say, do you travel with the team for, for road games? And what are accommodations like on your road? Are you on your own or, or what generally happens? Yeah, these days there's very few teams that will uh, have their outside media travel with the team. I, I, maybe there could be one or two left. I think Green Bay might be one of them. But for the most part, team or you know, there's team media. There's the people who work for the actual team websites and people who are employees of the team. They will travel with them. But if you're working for a newspaper, you know, local television, television station, ESPN, whatever, then you're considered outside media. You're not a team employee, so they're not going to let you uh, be around a team, quite frankly, on the road, whether that's on the plane or in the team hotel, unless you, know, you happen to book that same hotel on your own. They don't really want you around, quite frankly. You know, they have sort of that barrier where they want a level of privacy away from the media. So, no, we don't, we don't travel with the team, but it's our own, you know, it's our own accommodations, whatever you know, flights we want to get, whatever hotel we want to stay at. It's all obviously paid for by our companies, but um, it's not actually the same accommodations as the team. Sure, sure. Uh, sticking on kind of, the, I'll say this, inside perspective uh, for us, Mike, you, and you made reference a little bit earlier to um, uh, the, uh, the teams with uh, regards to press conferences and the like. Uh, the, the clubs pretty much unilaterally across the NFL control the, the media in, in terms of things like, like access to the players and, and, and head coach. Do you have you know, time beyond, I'll, I'll call the, the prescribed uh, situations? Yeah, it, it really depends on each team, I'd say, and, and how they want to do things. And it's, it's probably night and day, I'd say, between the Patriots and the Bills, or even since I've been in Buffalo, there's been a change at their public relations staff. So, you know, the Patriots are very, uh, I want to say, you know, they're tight with the media um, in, in terms of they're not going to allow very much outside of what the NFL requires, which is one head coach press conference per day, the 45 minutes in the locker room, et cetera. Uh, they're not going to really go above and beyond. And, you know, there's some, there's probably some reason on their end for that. It's a very big media contingent in New England, it's probably the biggest in the league in terms of, you know, number of TV stations and reporters covering the team for some of the home games, it's going to be well over a hundred different credential media who are there in the press box. Um, and so, you know, they they need to keep things a little bit more controlled on their end. And, you know, they've had some controversies there as well. So I don't know if they, you know, Phil Belichick's going to be wanting to talk about a whole lot of things, you know, when certain scandals come up. But <laughs> Buffalo is a little different. You know, it's probably closer to, I'd say, you know, in the press box on a game day, it's probably 50 to 70. Uh, on a typical, you know, weekday, it's probably 15 to 20 media members that are there. So it's a little bit of a different environment, uh, smaller time feel, I'd say. And so when I first got here, the PR staff was, you know, very controlling in terms of what sort of access they would allow. They put out a whole 10 page media policy for one of our off season practices and what we could report and couldn't report. And there's definitely a lot of tension, I think with the media over that. So, the Bills actually made a change at their with their PR staff last season, and they brought in somebody from Philadelphia who's considered much more media friendly. And really, ever since then, if we want to have a one on one with the head coach or the general manager or talk to a player, they're pretty much going to say yes to everything. And their whole philosophy is just have as good of a relationship as possible with the media, and hopefully, it works out well for them and for us. And I'd say a year into that, it's working out pretty well. 
Good. Yeah, I'm sure it's easy for you to, to, to buy into that. that. That's good to hear. In terms of the game day uh, experience that you uh, that you reference, what is it like for you, Mike? And uh, uh, you know, is there a lot of preparation work? This stuff that people don't think about, we wouldn't see as as, as viewers and listeners behind the scenes. Uh, and and then secondly, are you uh, are you on the uh, on on the field most of the time? I'm actually in the press box uh, for really the entire pregame period, and then post or during the game as well. And then we go down post game into the locker room and then also into a, a separate press conference room where we talk to the head coach and in some cases a couple of the star players. So there actually was a, a short time here in Buffalo where we were on the field before the game and that they actually tightened that up where they didn't want as many reporters down there sort of roaming the field trying to talk to people before the game and they, they just limited it to photographers and TV cameras. So I'm basically restricted to sitting up in a press box, but it's not bad. You know, Buffalo, after November 1st, the weather's not going to be great down on the field anyway. So it's uh, can't complain too much about sitting in, you know, heated slash air-conditioned press box the entire you know entire pregame in the game as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's some level of preparation, I'd say, that goes into it. I, I think it just it's good to know the background of, what's been happening with the team statistically or uh, just analysis or perspective, just so you know when X, Y, or Z happens during the game. Or, you know, for instance, last season, if Tyrod Taylor had a bad game and my requirement is to write a story that publishes within five minutes of the end of the game, I'm not going to have a whole lot of time to go back and research what he was doing, you know, a couple weeks before that. So I, I sort of have to just know it just, you know, as background knowledge myself. So, you know, let's say the fourth quarter rolls around and Tyrod Taylor is thrown for no touchdowns and two interceptions and it's been a bad game for him. Well, I can sort of put it in context in my story pretty quickly and then publish that by the end of the game. And that's really, I'd say my main responsibility is getting that story ready uh, for the end of the game just because of the nature of the Internet. You know, we need to have something up right away and then we kind of come back after we go down to the locker room and we talk to the players and we talk to the coach, we may come back later with the second story that adds even more context to what happened in that game and, and what it means within, you know, the, the scope of the entire season. So that's really, I'd say, my responsibilities on game day. But there's also, in some games, not every game, there's some sort of TV responsibility given that we're, you know, a television company where there may be, I may have to go on television before the game or after the game and, and tape something with Sports Center. Uh, it really depends on the situation, but pretty much every single game will have a, a camera crew that's there and sort of ready for me to hop on and uh, potentially go live on television as well. It's obviously, a, at least on game day, kind of a hectic situation for you at times. Do you have an assistant? Is, is there anyone else to, to, to help you out, Mike? No, I don't. It's funny. When I actually, when I was working uh, for ESPN Boston, when I was at PC, that was basically my job for Mike Reese, who is the Patriots supporter for ESPN. Um, you know, basically a student assistant, intern, whatever you want to call it. And so when he was consumed with, you know, let's say Tom Brady got injured, hypothetically, you know, and he was focused on writing that story. Well, it would usually fall upon me to cover whatever other angle would be appropriate. You know, there's obviously still a game that might have taken place. So if Rob Gronkowski had three touchdowns, then I'd, I would have to write that story while Mike focused on that. I don't really have that luxury in Buffalo. Um, in fact, I don't really think anywhere ESPN is really having a second reporter be there. Um, just sort of based on our, our recent editorial philosophy. So our focus is just if there's a major story, that's what we're going to cover. And if we're leaving something behind, that's just, you know, consequence of, of the game, basically. So um, I don't really have an assistant, but it's just, you know, I do have, I, I would say, obviously a pretty robust editorial team back in, in, in Bristol, Connecticut, where ESPN is, where, if I can't write a story very quickly, if I have to go on TV or if I have to go do an interview, then there are people who can get a story started, you know, four or five paragraphs and, and sort of get it going for me. But 
Uh, there's usually nobody else on site to help me. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, Mike, you uh, you majored in finance and, and management here at PC. Uh, how did you get your involvement or start, I should say, in, in sports journalism? Yeah, it's a great question. A lot of people tend to ask me that, and it, it, say it goes back to high school when you know I grew up in Massachusetts. I was a pretty big Patriots fan growing up, and um, you know I'd read a lot of books about the team and, and watch a lot of documentaries or whatever on you know NFL films on TV. And I always like to hear about how, whether it was a GM or a coach or somebody else, sort of how they got their start in the business. And in a lot of cases, it was just that person being persistent and emailing or, you know, calling people back in the day, uh, writing letters, trying to get their foot in the door that way. And if you go back and look at a lot of the great coaches in history, that's, that's in a lot of times how they got their start. So I thought, Hey, you know, I love to work in football somehow. And, you know, that's probably the way to do it. And I was emailing a lot of people who actually worked for the Patriots at the time and spoke to a few of them on the phone. And then, I was also emailing Mike Reese, who I mentioned, uh, who at the time I think was working for the Boston Globe, and then he ended up going over to ESPN Boston when they launched that in 2009, which would have been my first year at PC. And we kind of corresponded back and forth for, I'd say, two years. And then it was the summer before my sophomore year at PC where he offered me the chance to come by uh, and do what I mentioned before, uh, come to training camp and help him write a story and help out whatever he needed. And at the time it was not a paid position. It was just, Hey, come by, get the experience. You're almost an intern. And that basically grew into me going to practice uh, during the regular season, me covering games during the regular season. They were paying me a small amount, you know, it wasn't anything to live on, but uh, it was something. And so I was actually commuting uh, from PC to uh, Foxborough, which is, you know, about a half hour drive, my final three years at PC, which would have been 2010, 11, and 12, those seasons. So I was actually scheduling a lot of my, my classes around the Patriots press conferences and the Patriots practice times. And I was able to get up there, I'd say, at least three days a week, if not four, uh, which was, you know, good experience. And then they were sending me on the road to some Patriots games as well. Uh, which was pretty fun. So that's really how it, I, I got started. Even though I was, you know, a finance and management major at PC, you know, I, I knew I wanted to work in football, sports business somehow. I just sort of started down the path of media. And here we are, you know, 10 years later, and um, I'm enjoying it. So I really have no plans on, on changing my career path. That, that's great. That's great. You obviously need a lot of skills uh, to do what you're doing, uh, speaking and writing, planning. You made reference to uh, some some time management issues uh, when you were in, in, in college. Uh, in, in what ways do you think your, your, your PC education experience overall helped prepare you for, for this career path, Mike? Well, I definitely say it's the, the liberal arts and the, the writing aspect of it where you know, I think it's good to go to journalism school, and I, I don't want to knock, you know, the Northwesterns and Syracuses and, and some of the great J schools of the world, but, you know, our jobs definitely come down to being able to write well and, you know, being able to cr think critically and analyze different situations that come up because we're not only reporters, but we're also analysts and we're columnists in our job. Uh, so we're not only just reporting the facts, but we're also giving opinions and having to, um, you know, not only just give the opinion, just throw it out there, but we also have to back it up with some sort of logic, some sort of thought, which is certainly, you know, building a foundation at PC with uh, not only philosophy, but English and, you know, just having that, that base of knowledge to work off of. And, um, you know, that sort of education, I think, helps in that field. And, you know, there's probably some aspects of journalism that I miss not going to, you know, communications program somewhere. But, you know, I, I think our job is still a lot of on the job training and uh, just being out there and actually doing it as opposed to going to school for, you know, a master's degree in journalism or, or anything like that. I think that's it's more valuable just to have the, the on the job experience and, you know, going to PC allowed me to, to not only do that, you know, 30 minutes from Foxborough, but 
the actual education aspect as well was was pretty valuable. Mike, let's talk a little bit about the NFL itself. Uh, last year, the, the TV ratings were down uh, about 10% from the previous year. How much of a factor do you think was the uh, was the national anthem uh, controversy in in that? And um, were there other factors uh, for the uh, the, the uh, decline? Yeah, I, I think it's it's probably hard to point to one specifically. I think the national anthem definitely had some role, and it, it depends on where you go in the country too. I know in the Northeast, obviously, generally is more liberal, and I don't think too many people were changing their, their viewing habits because of that. Um, but in my aspect, you know, my girlfriend's from Alabama. I was down there visiting some of her family last year. And obviously that's a different part of the country politically. And some of the conversations I was having with them were, you know, there's some level of, of them being upset about players protesting their the anthem. And that seemed to turn them off to some degree about the NFL. So you know, I think it's hard to pin down, um, you know, again, one cause for the, the ratings decline. You also have to look at just the general viewing habits of, of Americans. You know, people watch less television these days. And that's a big problem for our company as well, where people aren't watching Sports Center, They aren't watching some of our studio shows as much. People aren't subscribing to cable as much, which hurts our bottom line as a business. So, just generally, if there's less people owning television or owning cable subscriptions, the ratings are going to go down for the NFL, as they will for most other shows, too. And I think you have seen that. So I think some of it might be political. Some of it might be people getting turned off to some of the concussions and the head injuries that have happened in the game and some of the science behind that about the long-term effects of those injuries. And I think some of it is just simply people not sitting down and watching a television as much. Sticking with the um, uh, national anthem uh, co- controversy, I believe that the NFL owners and the Players Association are continuing negotiations on on on, on, on coming to terms with this. From your own perspective, uh, what do you what do you think will happen? What what's reasonable to to expect here? Yeah, that's a tough one because I think there's the two sides are so. Um, they're driven into their their sides of the issue where you talk to some players who are just so upset about some of the social justice issues that they perceive to be true in the country. And then there's a, the other side of the issue with some of the owners who believe that this is affecting their business. As we just mentioned, that uh, they don't want players to protest sort of on company time on national television because they believe it, it hurts their business. And it's tough to say if anybody is either side of this issue, if anybody's going to cave. Um, at this point, the NFL came out a couple months ago with a new policy, essentially saying, if you're going to protest, do it by staying in the locker room during the national anthem and not by kneeling during the national anthem, which, again, a lot of people consider to be a sign of, of disrespect to the flag. Um, but a lot of players aren't willing to do that because they believe that's their platform when they're on camera and when television is showing them kneeling during the national anthem, that's their chance to promote whatever cause they want to promote, which is often something they talk about after the game. Whereas if they're in the locker room, nobody's going to see them. Nobody's going to miss them, essentially. And I think that's the NFL's goal is to sort of push it away and and make it less of an on-field issue. So, you know, it's hard to say exactly where this is going to go. Uh, if teams are going to discipline players, if they're going to suspend them or fine them if they're dealing during the anthem. I think the NFL feels a lot of pressure from the president, who is obviously talking about this a lot. Um, but players, you know, for a lot of players, this is a cause that's it's very close to them. And um, I don't think they want to cave to the president or, or cave to a billionaire who happens to own their team. Um, I don't know if there's if there's a good answer. Uh, I think eventually players are going to have to find a way to promote their causes outside of the anthem, uh, whether it's something on their cleats, which they've done before in the NFL, or some sort of message on their uniform, or something that is maybe less provocative to people who, who again, feel disrespected by the flag. But um, this is something where I think there's there's not a ton of middle ground. 
I would agree, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for for sharing that perspective. Uh, on, on a lighter note, uh, obviously here we're in the midst of uh, Patriots uh, country, and you've worked for the for the Patriots in the, in, in the past. But from the Bills standpoint, um, what what are your predictions for for the upcoming season? Uh, you know, what do you what do you expect to see? Uh, I, I'm hearing that uh, they seem to be uh, or should be particularly strong on on defense, which is kind of been their trend the last few seasons and they certainly have some exciting young players like uh, like Josh Allen at the quarterback from from Wyoming so so what are you thinking about we we do face you a couple of times uh, during the season exactly yeah I mean this has been a division owned by the Patriots for all but two seasons now since Tom Brady and Bill Belichick have been around so the Bills have always been you know, in some cases, they believe that they can get to first place in the division and win it. But I think usually the more realistic goal for the team is just to get to second place and, and try to get a wild card spot and get into the playoffs as they did last season. So I think that that's, until Tom Brady retires, that's probably going to be the goal for the Bills is just to get to the wild card, get into the playoffs, and, and see what they can do from there. The question is if they have the right tools on offense right now to get that done. As you mentioned, they drafted Josh Allen, their quarterback, seventh overall, but he's considered a very raw prospect. He's a really strong arm, seems to be a really smart kid, but he was playing at a a really a mid-level school at Wyoming, didn't have a great completion percentage, didn't have a great overall record, and seems to have a pretty big learning curve for the NFL. To expect him to come in as a rookie and to lead that team to the playoffs, if he does win the starting job, probably probably a little too much to expect. I think a lot of Bills fans would, would agree with that as well. So this might be considered more of a rebuilding year for them. You know, they have potential issue with LaShawn McCoy and maybe some legal trouble that might be happening for him down in Atlanta. He's their best player. He's their star running back. So if they end up losing him, that would be a huge blow. But as you, as you mentioned, their, their defense is looking pretty strong and if this team will find its way back to the playoffs, it's probably winning low scoring games, you know, avoiding turnovers, the sort of managed quarterback play that we hear about. But they're they're still a far cry from the Patriots. And again, until Tom Brady leaves, I think that that gap is probably not going to close very much. This has really been a, a fun and eye opening conversation. We we really appreciate your, your your time. Thank you really so much for for being with us. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Sure, and continue good luck in your career. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank you, our listeners, for joining us today on the Province College Podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast at all the usual places, and they are available on the college's YouTube channel. We welcome feedback at podcast at providence.edu. Thanks again to our producer, Chris Judge. I'm Charlie Joyce. Until next time.